Well, yesterday, Beth and I were going away this weekend to celebrate it um, a bit more fully, but yesterday we celebrated 37 years of marriage. Yeah, it was wonderful. Or wonderful. <coughs> I was wed at the age of 10. So <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, pray. We are so grateful, God, for this opportunity to join together to uh, worship you, to pray, and to receive from you. We invite your Holy Spirit to minister here tonight in our hearts and minds. Reveal to us Jesus Christ more fully, more completely, that our intimacy with him might increase and that your power might grow in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. I am really going to try to speak for only 30 minutes tonight. Matthew chapter 16. It's a unique story we find here. Jesus begins by asking his disciples, verse 13, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Of course, he's referring to himself. Now, they were ready with an answer. They had their ear to the ground. They were, they were hearing um, the talk around town about this itinerant preacher named Jesus. They said, some say, you're John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? I think it grew quiet, that little group of men, because Jesus was still an enigma to them. Their hopes were pinned on uh, the idea that he might, in fact, be the promised Messiah. But in their minds, the Messiah was going to be a military and governmental leader, um, They were unable to grasp the notion of a suffering servant, a lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And uh, so they fell silent. Suddenly, Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I think it surprised Peter when those words tumbled out of his mouth as much as it did his fellows there. He must have said and thought, I hope I haven't blundered badly here. (laughs) Then Jesus said something really intriguing. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He was explaining simply that Peter hadn't learned this from anyone. And it wasn't uh, deduced through his own keen intellectual insight, this had been revealed to him suddenly by God. And in fact, whenever a man or a woman receives Christ as Savior, they have experienced something akin to that. It's not as if... uh, Receiving Christ and Savior is just purely transactional. Someone explains to us uh, who Jesus was, who He is, what He came to accomplish, and what He's made available to us. And uh, we review what they've explained, we give it some thought, and, and we make the considered decision to accept Him. It really doesn't work that way. There is this convicting and convincing uh, power, the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts and minds that moves us to a point of decision through, on some level, an actual encounter with Jesus Christ. I'm not suggesting we see Him, but awakened within our hearts and minds is truth on a level we, we've never experienced it. We have an experiential moment with Jesus Christ that convinces us of His reality. And from that point forward, 
uh, Paul writes to us in the book of Romans, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So something supernatural happens there. The question is, I think, what triggers that? And are there more such revelations that await us as God's children? I love Jesus, do you? I'm to be perfectly frank, I'm head over heels in love with Jesus. I have been such a since a small child. I'm desperately in love with that woman over there. I adore her and I'm grateful to God for her. But Jesus is the lover of my soul. I yearn for more of Him in my life. A a day is coming when we will not be separated by the, the dimensions that separate us from His presence. Now, we will see Him face to face. I can't wait. It's going to be extraordinary. But we can begin enjoying intimacy with Jesus Christ right now on a greater level than we presently enjoy. And that intimacy can increase, and along with it, God's power at work in our lives. His faith released in our hearts. Look with me, if you would, at Ephesians uh, chapter 3. Again, Peter did not through observation, study, and deep thought discover who Jesus was. It was an act of grace as God revealed to Peter through His Spirit who in fact Jesus really was. It was an unveiling. In fact, we'll see in a moment the word truth, Jesus is the truth. Not a truth. John 14, 6 explains he's the truth, the way, and the life. Truth is uh, aletheia. It's an interesting word. Um, it means truth and reality, but also refers to an unveiling or a disclosure. That's what Peter experienced, an unveiling of this enigma with whom he had been traveling, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 3, we'll go back to the first chapter in a moment, but I want you to see, beginning with verse 14, this prayer which Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. That's something each of us desperately requires, to be strengthened with might, by His Spirit in our inner man. That's where we derive our real strength from. The impartation of God through His Spirit in our inner man. Now, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What's happening when we read the Word, when we commune with Him? The Bible really is unlike any other piece of literature that you're ever going to encounter, isn't it? John 6.63, Jesus said, My words are spirit, and they are life. So when we are reading God's Word, when we're meditating upon it, something supernatural is at work in us. It's a catalyst for something profound that can be liberated in our lives and in our experience. The, the, The power of God can be released into our person, power that translates into transformed lives and through uh, power for living for sure, but power to minister to others that we encounter along life's, life's way who are in need. Now there's a young man uh, I bumped into several weeks ago, six, maybe eight weeks ago at the marina in Palaka where we keep our sailboat docked and I'm guessing he's in his early 30s. And he was, 
he's sailing his boat. He has a uh, he has plans to sail all, uh, I guess, for the next several years and live on his boat. And uh, uh, in, in chatting with him, it became fairly apparent he really did not know Jesus. Um, my grandfather would have said he's as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. Uh, and, and slightly troubled in, in a few areas. And so we chatted at length for a while. And I didn't have one of these with me, but uh, he gave me... A, uh, his telephone number, uh, and he had he wanted to be able to call someone who had a little more experience sailing, and I thought, I have a little more experience sailing. <laughs> um, and so he, he began to text me and, and call me, and I had an opportunity to gradually share with him uh, the good news and encourage him to read the book of John, the book of Ephesians, and he's done that, and he's asking the most marvelous questions, and he's allowed me to pray with him, but there are some issues in his life. Uh, we'll, we'll be meeting again in the next couple of weeks. There are some issues in his life that require God's power to remedy. I want to be able to serve him in that capacity. I want God's power to be at work sufficiently in me so that I can minister to him life on the level that he requires it. So I'm, I'm in need of this power. And of course, uh, as a, a human being, I'm flawed. I want uh, my life to be more reflective of the glory of Jesus that lives in me. And so I'm, I'm trusting God for transformation, I hope just as you are, uh, so that we can be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. That happens through uh, the introduction of this power, this life of God in us. Uh, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Now, I want you to say with me aloud that last phrase again, that you, or excuse me, uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. He wants us to know something which surpasses knowledge. That seems a little paradoxical, doesn't it? Paul, how can I know something that surpasses knowledge? I could relate to you right now um, an experience I had in the Darien jungle, eating with um, a tribe of um, Chicoy Indians. We had um, yucca root that was fried in a very primitive little hut. It was like three or four feet off the ground. You stepped on a, a log with notches cut in it to get to it, a fire pit built on the, the floor, which was some sort of woven material. There were no walls, a thatched roof. Um, it was a very primitive village. The men had just graduated to loincloths. Uh, the women had too. That was the extent of their clothing. Uh, there, were, there were some chickens. They were running around. There were, there were monkeys. It was a very different environment. I've never eaten in a restaurant quite like it here. <laughs> and they were Christians. We worshipped God together in that little hut. It was a unique experience. I can tell you what we ate, what we drank. I can, I can describe the event. I can describe the environment, the surroundings. But you're going to relate to what I'm saying. Um, you're going to fill that in with images that comport with your own experience. Whatever we hear, we interpret and, and flesh out with our own perspectives or through our own perspectives, which are informed by a myriad of, of experiences and what we've learned, what we think we've learned, what we know, what we imagine we know that we may know incorrectly. Um, we can only approximate. Can't actually know. I can tell you about my dog, Maisie. She's a, a boxer. Tan, light brown. 
a boxer English mix. She's a handful. I can describe her to you, but you're actually going to see a dog that's a composite of all the brown dogs and boxers you've seen. It's probably not going to be my Maisie. You can't. Those are the limitations of human language. Now I can tell you about Jesus. We can read in the Word about Jesus. We can read about God. We can read what He wishes for us, but each one of us are going to transpose over those words our own meaning. In truth, many of us worship, we believe, we do believe in God as, as I believe, Creator, uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but there can be real disparity uh, between each of us with regard to what we actually believe about God. Many times, uh, the God we believe in, in the particulars, is a God more of our own making than God as He actually is. We could have a collection of a hundred uh, different Christians in this room, and we could ask a simple question like, what does God mean to you? Who is Jesus? And we would have an array of answers to those questions. And they might all enjoy a certain similarity, though there may also be extraordinary differences, but they're all going to be slightly different. Why is that? Because we interpret things, uh, we all interpret things differently. I see life through a different set of eyes than you do. My perspectives are going to be different from yours uh, in, in regard to a lot of important things. And, and my perspective is really what's going to uh, help me reach conclusions that I'm going to reach about any experience or anything that I'm learning. Is God, do you think God is going to hell, hold himself, allow himself to be held hostage by a situation like that? Held hostage to the inadequacies of human language? Held hostage to our own biases and prejudice? Held hostage to our ignorance? A thousand times no. He will not. It was demonstrated in Matthew 16 when, when Jesus, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? They offered uh, uh, an array of responses to that. Well, here's what people are saying. And they had their own thought. And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? No one spoke until Peter spoke up and what he declared had been revealed to him by God. And that was the only means by which he could have accurately defined who Jesus was. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you content to know God as you imagine him to be? Or do you want to know God as he really is? That's, I want to know God as he really is. There's something transformative in that revelation. Do you remember, I think it's uh, 1 John 3, verse 2, when we see him talking about Jesus, we will... Anyone finish that for me? Hmm? When we see Him, we shall become like Him. In a moment, we'll be transformed. The more we... The better, rather, we know Him. The more accurate our understanding of Him. I believe the more our lives begin to reflect Him. It becomes transformative in our life and experience. I want to know Him as He really is. I want to see Him so that I can become, through the power of His Holy Spirit at work in me, more like Him. Does that sound good to you? Does that sound like something you would want to experience? Well, Paul continues. Um, let's see. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So what he is suggesting here is if you and I are to know something which passes knowledge, clearly he's inviting us into an experience. I can tell you uh, about a marvelous uh, uh, dish that I sampled at a local eatery, but if you've never had it, there's a limit to what you can understand about it. But the moment you eat it you, and experience it, you will have a knowledge of that particular dish that you can't have through any other means. 
Have you ever had a hot pepper? Can you adequately express what you experienced through words when you ate that pepper? No, it's just horrible. <laughs> um, but it's, you can't really relate that. It's something that you have to experience. Paul is urging us on and praying for the church in Ephesus that they would have an encounter with Jesus, an actual experience that allows them to know Him as He is. And it liberates all kinds of power. Look here uh, at, at the end of that. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to Him who is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I've heard that verse quoted for so many years. I, I, I want God to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I ask or think. But it is according to the power that is at work in me. That is what regulates the flow, if you will, of that power. So I want to experience as much of Jesus as I can through personal encounter, through this extraordinary experience. There's a word for this. Look uh, back at Ephesians, the first chapter now. Paul uh, opens this letter by uh, uh, informing the church at Ephesus that he is praying for them a very special prayer. For this reason, verse 15, I too, having heard of the, faith, uh, of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. He prayed that uh, this church and its members in particular would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And I'm not going to take time to read through the benefits of that, but it, 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 there are three things in particular that He wanted them uh, to know and understand. But instead, I want you to turn with me please to um, uh, John the fourth chapter. Imagine for a moment some member of a tribe who has had no contact with the outside world in the Amazon basin. And that uh, a member of that tribe is plucked up suddenly and, and whisked off to Los Angeles or New York City and lives there for two years. He experiences... Um, what would to him be wonders? Foods he's never imagined. The ability to regulate the temperature of the room you're in. Flight. A, a, a travel by automobile. Stores. Abundance everywhere. A bed to sleep in. Comfortable linens. Uh, beautiful music. Entertainment. He would learn a whole new way of living, wouldn't he? Now imagine, two years later, he has suddenly returned and deposited in that village. I think he might be like the Apostle Paul, who had an experience in which he actually ascended into heaven. He saw heaven, experienced it. And from that point forward, he said, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with him, which is far better but it's more needful that I remain with you. So he lived with this tension in his life. Um, I would imagine that that native would be uh, in a similar position. Eager to be back among his people and to help lift them. But also frustrated because life would be so very different. But then he might have the challenge of trying to communicate with them what he had experienced. 
How could he talk about air conditioning? Well, it's cold. Well, we live in the Amazon basin. It's it's a uh, it's a rainforest. What is cold? Well, there are ice cubes. What are cubes? What is ice? <laughs> music. Try to explain to them music or film or air travel. Imagine the challenges. And this is certain, no matter how well he explained it. Now, their language would be inadequate. Their vocabulary simply wouldn't be large enough to express what he would have to share. So there would be that terrific boundary. But also, the very best they could do is have an approximate understanding. And because of their limited experience, what they're imagining would be a far different thing than he was actually describing, right? Jesus encounters a woman. Uh, we, we're familiar with this story, I'm sure, uh, the Samaritan woman. And let's go ahead and, and skip over uh, much of the story right now. Uh, there's a good deal to unpack, but let's just, let's just go to... Um, uh, you're familiar with the story, right? He asks for a drink. She's, she's surprised. He's a man asking her. Uh, he's also a Jew asking a Samaritan. Uh, there were all kinds of, of tensions between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Uh, if you think sexism is a problem today, step back a couple of thousand years. As, why are you as a man asking me for this? You want to use our utensils to drink out of my cup? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. None of this is done. And, uh, and Jesus is, is obviously trying to reach beyond that moment and, and lead her to eternal life. The woman said, he explains to her about eternal life. The woman said to him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, now don't, don't get the notion that he's, he's, this is a gotcha moment. He's actually very gently revealing to her that he knows the whole story. And there's really nothing to hide. You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now she was probably quite aware of the immorality of her life and all of the conflict that it was inviting. After all, she was here at roughly noon, the heat of the day. Women usually traveled uh, to the well in group, not alone, and they normally did it during the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening, not alone in the middle of the day. But her lifestyle probably caused her great shame, and she was likely shunned by many of the women in Samaria, and so she made this lonely trip out in the heat of the day to escape uh, their ridicule and shame. And so Jesus uh, cuts right to the heart of the matter, discusses her situation. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, uh, Gerasim. Uh, they built their own temple there. They were the Samaritans. The Assyrians, I think in 722, had had um, conquered uh, uh, the northern kingdom and had um, uh, transported many of the Jews uh, away from there and, and resettled other peoples there. So there was, uh, uh, they, the, the Jews that remained, uh, the wealthy ones were removed, some of the poor ones remained, and the, uh, they intermarried. There was syncretism likely that occurred, and so the Samaritans, they believed the Pentateuch. They didn't believe the rest of the the books in the Hebrew canon were were actually um, uh, to be believed. So they dismissed them all. And rather than worship at the temple in Jerusalem, they had a temple in uh, on Mount Gerizim. And so she said, "Look, this is where we worship. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship." Jesus said to her, "Woman, believe me, an hour is coming." when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. I want you to look closely at what Jesus just said. He said, you, you all, you're not even close. 
we know, did he say who? Or did he say what? He said what we worship. We know what we worship, not who. The Jews had uh, a distant relationship with God in as much as their God was the God of whom? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was relational, but it was a covenant relationship they enjoyed through the headship of those men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was largely how they related to God. And so God said, we know what we worship, not who. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers in spirit. He's suggesting not simply that God is a spirit, but He's invisible. He's divine. He's the Creator. He's not fashioned with hands. He's not bound to a locality. He's not bound to a an ethnicity, he's not bound to a tribe or to a people or to a nation. He transcends all of that. We must worship him in spirit and what? Truth, it's the same word. We worship him because he has revealed himself to us. Now, his chief revelation has occurred through who? Or his revelation has occurred through Jesus Christ. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Who, who described himself as the truth and the way and the life. Uh, let's, let's close there by turning to John the 14th chapter, please. Um, John 14, Jesus announces in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he continues in verse um, 16. I know, before I read that, I want you to remember Paul's... Um, story in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 12. Remember he related, m most um, scholars agree that Paul is referring to himself. I knew a man who, uh, had, had, uh, who went to heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. But he had ascended to the third heaven, to heaven. And uh, he said he heard things. Now, I, the King James says, not lawful to be uttered, but the thought is, he heard things for which we lack the ability and language to communicate. It's like that native pluck, uh, pet plucked up from the Amazonian village. You get back, I, I don't have the words to describe what I've experienced. Our language doesn't even contain that vocabulary. Paul saw things that exceeded his ability to describe them and our ability to appreciate them. In John 14, Jesus, um, beginning uh, with verse 14, or excuse me, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He abides with you and He will. He's forecasting what will be available to the church following His death, burial, and resurrection will be in you. Now, Jesus was with the disciples, right? How many of you would like to have walked with Jesus? Wouldn't that have been extraordinary? But in truth... You and I enjoy an opportunity to know Him more intimately than the disciples ever did before His resurrection. He was with them, but He promised them, the Holy Spirit is coming. Remember just a few verses earlier, He said, look, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit, and He explains that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of Himself but only speaks of Jesus. In truth, just as God came to us in the person of Jesus, Jesus comes to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why uh, a, a, a Holy Spirit experience is a Jesus experience. You're having an encounter with Jesus, God the Son, through God the Holy Spirit. It is a Jesus experience. That's why when you're in, a, in certain services, 
where uh, His presence has been welcomed and cultivated through worship, you experience Him when you walk into the room. One of my first, uh, one of the first things I really uh, that really impacted me when I became a part of the charismatic movement. I remember walking into that church the first time in the in the 1970s, and I instantly sensed the presence of Jesus there. And there was this ebullience, this um, this joy and gladness that wasn't ginned up. It was just present, and it was extraordinary. I could not believe what I was experiencing. And it, and it just grew and grew and grew. It was wonderful. I was, what was I doing? I was encountering Jesus. I will ask the Father, verse 16, and He will give you another helper that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him but you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world uh, will no longer see Me, but you will see Me because I live. You will live also. He is with you in the person of His Holy Spirit. John went so far to say that you do not need any man to teach you. Now, he's not contradicting himself. He's not suggesting... No need to come to church anymore. No need to listen to teachers. You have no need of them. Because he's informing them, after all, through an epistle he's written to them for their instruction. What he is saying is there are limitations to what can be accomplished from this pulpit. And through merely reading this as if it is a piece of literature to be memorized, There is a dimension of encounter and experience with Him that exceeds the ability of any man to communicate or any book to adequately communicate. What He speaks to us by His Spirit will always, 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 always be in perfect agreement with this book and harmonize with it. If someone says to you, well, what I've received, really, you're not going to find in there, then you simply say as politely as you can, that's not something I'm interested in. <laughs> That didn't come from God. If God speaks to us by His Spirit, you're always going to find it in perfect harmony. Not mostly, but in perfect harmony with what is recorded in this book. But there is a limitation to what I can achieve up here. You say, <laughs> we're quite aware of that. <laughs> what you must experience, if you want to experience this fantastic liberation, of God the Holy Spirit in you, His power released in you and through you, you need an encounter with Jesus. You need the teacher that is not just with you, He's in you to be released to reveal more of Jesus to you. How do we encourage that? I'm, I'm asking you, how do we encourage that? Okay, one way is very obvious. We just read how Paul was praying for this for people. So we pray this for ourselves, don't we? We ask God to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is a prayer I am praying constantly for people that I minister to. This is a prayer I've been praying for decades for my own family and over my own life. We can ask God for this, and He will swiftly and gladly and abundantly supply it. But we also need humility. We can't know Him apart from this. And we have to acknowledge that. You uh, may be a terribly intelligent person, but if you really want to be smart, then you need to acknowledge, I'm just not smart enough to be smart enough. I know that what I want to learn, what I want to know, what I want to experience can only be granted to me through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And so I am going to make this now a priority in my life. When I pick up the Word of God, I'm going to approach it with humility. It's pregnant with meaning. It's always giving birth to meaning. You can read the same verse a thousand times and suddenly Jesus steps out of those pages 
and you see something you've never seen before. Or more to the point, you see Him more clearly than you've ever seen Him before. If someone needs healing, one of the first prayers that I pray for them is, Lord Jesus, make Yourself known to them as healer. Healing follows on the heels of such a revelation. Well, I'm going to stop there or I'm going to end up going on longer. Um, I hope this was helpful to you. And um, we're going to just pray right now real quickly before we in, uh, come up here for prayer. And then again, uh, I want to encourage you. That's a simple prayer to pray. But, but pray it each day, sincerely from your heart. Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I so want to know you. I want to know you better. I want to know you more intimately. And I really want to know you as you really are. I don't want my ignorance to stand in the way any longer. I don't want my biases and prejudices to stand in the way. I don't want uh, standing in the way what I think I know when what I think I know may be all wrong. I want to know you as you really are. That kind of humility, God will uh, swiftly answer. Father, we ask you for this now in Jesus' name. We pray that you would give us this spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. That the ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, would be uh, realized in our lives more fully than before. That Jesus may be um, uh, rooted in our heart by faith. We so love you, Lord Jesus. We want to love you more. We want to know you more intimately. And we ask that you, uh, you make this happen, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.